Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Minkles with Jingles, and yes, the World of Warcraft expansion. It has been occupying an awful lot of my time this week, probably far too much. I now have two characters at maximum level, including the mighty Jingles himself. As you can see here, he's a very handsome young gnome, and he has excellent taste in hats. Now, I'm sure that most of you have probably made your minds up about World of Warcraft long before clicking play on this video. Um, all I'm going to say is any game that allows you to fly a giant parrot while shitting on the heads of hundreds of pirates <laughs> <laughs> is alright in my book. Are you yeah. <laughs> I do like a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. So, yeah, this week I've mostly just been binging on World of Warcraft, and I think the the novelty is wearing off, especially since I'd already played through to maximum level on one character in the beta test, prior to the release of the actual expansion itself. So I had actually... it, it kind of spoiled it. Well, it didn't kind of spoil it, it did completely spoil it. I mean, I knew exactly where to go and what to do. So playing through the actual expansion on the live servers was very much a case of been there, seen it, done it. I think signing up for the beta in this case was definitely a big mistake. Because I'm going to play the game anyway. I mean, it's not like, I don't know, there's a new game coming out that you have never played before and you like the look of it, so you sign up for access to the beta test and then you get into the beta. And you can consider it a sort of extended play test you know you like the look of the game is it actually going to be the sort of thing that you like to play and so in that respect signing up for a beta test and getting what's effectively early access to a game can be a good thing but if it's a game that you've been playing for the best part of the last 15 years and you know you're going to be playing the expansion anyway it's probably not a very good idea and while I have had fun playing the expansion this week and I have definitely done too much of it even the first time around, on the first character that I leveled to maximum level, it was... Well, it was a lot more grindy than it probably should have been, because I'd already done it before. And, yeah, I realise I'm... I'm not being ironic when I say grindy and World of Warcraft. I appreciate that it's an MMO. The grind is part and parcel of the game experience, but at least the first time you do it, it's fresh. You know, you're doing quests and levelling up in places that you've never seen, and interacting with characters that you've never seen before and so on and so on but well that's really not the case if you've already done it once in the beta test so yeah that was a bit of a mistake speaking of beta tests I've also signed up for the beta of The Division 2 um, I haven't exactly been closely following development of the game but I've paid some attention to what's going on and it looks quite good but then again I suppose it would I mean the only thing that I think has been released so far regarding gameplay in The Division 2 has been released by Ubisoft and they're not exactly going to release anything that makes it look bad. I mean, 20th Century Fox managed to make The Phantom Menace look good in the trailer, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but then again, I mean, I really did enjoy The Division. It's still one of those games that I do play semi-regularly and I appreciate it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I enjoyed the first game. I'm almost certainly going to enjoy the second game. Do I really want to be playing the beta? Because it might just ruin the whole starting experience for me when the game goes live. Pretty much has happened here in World of Warcraft. Then again, what if it's shit? <laughs> um, uh, you, you never know. It's entirely possible that Ubisoft can completely screw it up. It's happened before. Maybe I should be playing the beta test, because if I don't, then the only way I'm going to find out that I'm not going to enjoy it is when it's too late and I've already spent $60 on a brand new game that, well, if I'd bothered playing the beta I would have realised, ah, no, you need to stay away from this. Oh, but Jingles, you can just read the reviews. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. I'm using The Division 2 as an example, but it applies to, well, any similar type of game, whether it's The Division 2, World of Warcraft, a new expansion for Guild Wars 2, whatever. This type of thing. How much time are you going to dedicate to actually playing the game that you're going to write a review on? Because if it's a game like this, and you're spending one or two days playing it, 
all you're in a position to review is the starting and part of the leveling experience. You certainly won't be in a position to talk about the end game content, and you won't have a huge amount of experience, in fact probably a very limited amount of experience in the player versus player component of the game in question. You really have to spend weeks, possibly even as much as a month, playing a game like this in order to be in a fair position to actually write a knowledgeable review about it. Which means that any reviews that come out on or after release day of World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth, or The Division 2, or a new expansion for Guild Wars 2, are either going to be bullshit, <laughs> because the reviewer has spent nowhere near enough time playing it, or they're not actually reviewing the release content. What they're presenting a review of was the beta test. And I could have played the beta test myself. <laughs> That's the point. I don't want to spoil it. God damn it, you just can't win. Of course, sometimes a beta test of a game isn't actually a beta test at all. It's just a glorified part of the hype building exercise. Yes, Electronic Arts, Star Wars Battlefront, yes, I'm looking at you. Beta weekends. Really? <laughs> okay, admittedly. We are talking about a completely different genre of game here. You don't need to spend weeks playing the beta test of Star Wars Battlefront from Electronic Arts to know that it's a dog shit. A couple of hours should be enough. And yet, at the same time, maybe Electronic Arts are smarter than we give them credit for because limiting the beta to a couple of weekends in the month prior to the release of the game certainly generated hype. And if all you're getting to do is play a couple of hours over a weekend, every couple of weekends prior to release, you don't really, or certainly I, didn't really have enough time to understand that once the whole, oh wow, it's Star Wars, listen to the sound effects, oh, it's the John Williams music, wow, check out those graphics, you know, once, once you'd gotten all of that out of your system, the actual game was shit. <laughs> It was really, really bad. Um, so maybe Electronic Arts are actually smarter than we give them credit for by just limiting their beta test to a couple of weekends prior to the actual release of the game. Oh, and unless I'm very much mistaken, I mean, I may be. It wouldn't be the first time I've gotten something wrong. So if I am wrong, I do apologise. But I'm reasonably sure that the only way you could actually get into the beta weekends of Star Wars Battlefront was if you pre-ordered the game anyway. <laughs> so at that point, I suppose Electronic Arts didn't really care if you realised, oh my god, this is terrible. They already had your money. I suppose the only real way to be safe, I mean, unless you know that you're going to be playing the game anyway, um, such as, for example, World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth. I knew I was going to be playing this. But if you're sitting on the fence about it and you don't know whether or not you actually want to take the plunge and get this brand new upcoming full price game, then the only really safe way to go about it is to never pre-order, wait until the game's been released, then wait another month, at least another month, and then read the reviews. And don't just look at review scores or review score aggregates. Although if an aggregate review score for a game is particularly low, then that's probably a fairly good indication that the game in general stinks. But it's important that you actually do also read the reviews. Because not everybody likes the same thing, or wants the same thing, out of their games. For example, if I'm looking at a review, or multiple reviews of a new game that's come out that I quite like the look of, but I thought I'll check the reviews out first, and the player versus player combat in that game is universally getting slammed for being dog shit, I really don't care. <laughs> because... I don't really play this kind of game. Games like World of Warcraft, games like The Division, games like, heck, even Mass Effect. Uh, I'm, I'm more about the single player and the cooperative gameplay. I really just don't care about the PvP. So if a game's getting a bad review because the PvP's dog shit, I don't care. You know, what's the rest of it like? And that's why it's important for you to actually read the reviews, because not everybody likes the same things in games as the person writing the review does. So you have to read the review. Why does the reviewer 
like the game? Why does the reviewer not like the game? What parts of it do they like and do they not like? And why do they have those opinions? And a good reviewer should be able to explain that, which leads to you being in a better position to make an informed buying choice. And that's something I always try to do whenever I'm talking about a game, or a premium ship in World of Warships, or a premium tank in World of Tanks. I try to avoid just issuing blanket statements like, this is good, you should get it. Or this is terrible, you should stay away from it. Uh, unless it's World of Warplanes. The original version of World of Warplanes. <laughs> Not the relaunched version, which is actually quite fun. Uh, but the original version of World of Warplanes was absolutely terrible, and you definitely should have stayed away from it. And judging by the sales figures and the server population numbers, most of you did. Um, but yeah, I, I try to say, well, okay, this is what I like about the game. You may not like that, but here's why I like it. And this is what I don't like about this game, or this tank, or this ship. However, that might not bother you because of this, and so on, and so on, and so on. I very, very rarely just say, yeah, this is good, go out there and get it. Instead, I try to list the pros and the cons, explain why I think something's good, why I think something's bad. Appreciating that you may not have the same opinion, but striving to give you the information that you need so you can make your own mind up. Bearing in mind how much the thing costs as well. Like the Panzer II J, for example, in World of Tanks is so much fun it should be illegal. But good luck getting a hold of one for less than 100 euros. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> nope, it is not worth the money. Uh, you can't just review these things based on the content. You have to have a look at the price tag as well. And that's a problem with Jurassic World Evolution. I've been doing Jurassic World Evolution videos, I'm sure you've noticed. And I think the game is great. Um, I've had a lot of fun playing it. But there's no way it justifies that full price tag. I couldn't honestly recommend the game to anybody unless it was on sale. The content in the game was absolutely fine. Although, again, it wasn't to everybody's tastes. There were some complaints that it had kind of been dumbed down a little. There wasn't really that much complexity in the management side, but, well, it was always just intended to be a casual management game. I quite enjoyed the content, but there's no way there was enough of it to justify that full price tag. Content, or lack of it, was another issue in the division. When it was first released, there were some issues, which is always going to be the case in a brand new game is released. Less so when an expansion for a brand new game is released, although... Well, actually, that's something that was quite surprising about the Battle for Azeroth expansion for World of Warcraft. Historically, every time Blizzard have released an expansion for World of Warcraft, the expansion release day has always been an utter disaster tens of thousands of people stuck in login queues just unable to get in because the login servers have crashed under the strain. That didn't happen at all with Battle for Azeroth. It's taken them 12 to 14 years, but they finally got it right. Uh, I joined Yuzrol for his live stream, and we played for about eight hours, grinding through the content in Battle for Azeroth, and we were only disconnected twice. And once was due to a hotfix, where Blizzard deliberately took the servers down in order to apply a quick fix for... I'm not even sure what it was. Uh, there was one other occasion when we were both disconnected. The game suddenly, huge lag spike and bang, back to the login screen, but we were instantly able to get back in. Now that is not what previous Blizzard expansions have been like. Generally speaking, you tend to spend the first two or three hours just staring at the... you were unable to connect screen. Um, but with The Division, they had some issues like that when it went live. But generally speaking, the launch wasn't too bad. And most people seemed to enjoy the levelling experience, at least those who accepted that it was going to take several full magazines fired into a boss's head in order to kill them, because it was basically an MMO, not a third-person tactical shooter. But it was when people had levelled up, which took a couple of weeks after release, when people had hit that magical level 30 maximum level, that everybody realised there was actually nothing to do. People enjoyed the levelling experience, people enjoyed exploring Manhattan Island. But once they hit level 30, where's the game? Turned out the Division had actually shipped without much in the way of Endgame. Now I don't know if that was because the developers vastly underestimated how quickly people were going to reach maximum level and then start wondering what there was to do. 
or because they knew that the game was going to have to be rushed and they skipped on certain parts of the game, i.e. end game content, in order to ensure that the environment, Manhattan Island itself, and the levelling up experience was as flawless as possible. I suspect the latter. But again, that's not something that would have come to light if you'd only spent a couple of days playing the game in order to write a review of it. Now, lack of content is not a problem that anybody has ever been able to accuse World of Warcraft of suffering from. Well, that's not strictly true. Uh, people do accuse World of Warcraft and its various different expansions of not having enough content, but what they actually mean is not enough of the content that they like. There is, in fact, a huge and, frankly, intimidatingly large amount of things to do in World of Warcraft. Leveled 1 Alliance character? There are something like 12 different other character classes that you may like to choose, and if you've done all of those, try it from the Horde perspective. Play for the other side. There are multiple different forms and types of player versus player combat you can indulge in. There are three different flavours of dungeons you can run once you've hit end game content. Three different flavours of raids that you can run on normal, heroic or mythic difficulty settings. There are pet battles, pet collections, you can collect mounts. There are hundreds of different achievements to keep track of. It, it's frankly bewildering the amount of stuff that there is actually available to do in World of Warcraft. And it's that content. How can I put this? I have just finished leveling my second maximum level character. Jingles here is one of them, and the other is Callie, my human frost mage. On the weekend, I was watching Quickie Baby streaming World of Warcraft. He was playing... Fun. <laughs> couldn't make this up, right? Quickie Baby, even in World of Warcraft, he plays a tank. <laughs> Uh, the character he was playing, the first one that he's reached maximum level with in the new expansion, is a Dwarf Protection Warrior, a tank. And he was running dungeons with his wife, Peppy, who plays a Shaman, healer. So the ideal combination, if you want to get quick dungeons, all you need is three damage dealers. And damage dealers are a dime a dozen. Now, you may have already gathered that my approach when I'm playing a game like World of Warcraft is never mind the quality, feel the width. I like to have a lot of different characters. I'm a bit of an altaholic. Uh, Quitty Baby has the one character at maximum level, and he's lavishing all of his care and attention on that one character. He goes for the quality, rather than the quantity. Like I said, any number of different ways that you can go about doing this. Now, bearing in mind that I haven't actually focused a huge amount of attention on gearing up either of my two maximum level characters, I was quite surprised to see that, well, at the point where I was watching Quickie Baby tanking these five-man dungeons, my not, at the time, maximum level gnome here was only level 118, not level 120, and he had, in some equipment slots, better gear than Quickie Baby had, and he was doing heroic dungeons at maximum level. And I have to admit, this kind of rocked the foundations of my world just a little, um, because well, like I said, when you're running five-player dungeons in World of Warcraft, they come in three different flavours. There's normal, heroic, and mythic. Now, before you can even get into a heroic dungeon, it does require a minimum standard of gear. But what Quickie Baby was doing, and this is not unusual, um, with the tank and healer combination, they were very, very quickly getting dungeon groups and getting into these normal dungeons. And before too long, in fact, very quickly indeed, he'd reached the minimum required level of equipment to qualify for heroic dungeons, so he instantly started queuing up for those. And it wasn't hard. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't easy either, because he was at the bare minimum item level required to actually get into these heroic dungeons, but they were clearing the dungeons. He was having to work hard at it, but he's a good player. And then the second he'd reached the minimum required level of gear to do mythic dungeons, he was queuing up for those as well. Now. I've been playing World of Warcraft a very long time. And when the first expansion, The Burning Crusade, was released, this was the first time they introduced the whole concept of doing dungeons on a higher difficulty setting. Heroic level dungeons. And I can clearly remember the very first time my guild attempted to do a heroic dungeon. 
Now, my guild was pretty good. Still is. Certainly not the best guild in the world, but on our server we had a couple of server-first raid boss kills. Didn't have them all, but we had some. Basically, we had a lot of players who really knew what they were doing. And five of these players from our raid group got together to do one of the Burning Crusade World of Warcraft dungeons in heroic difficulty for the first time. Nobody really knew what to expect. This was all very, very new at the time. It took them not far short of three hours to complete this dungeon. And at certain points, because we were listening in on TeamSpeak, at certain points it looked like they weren't going to get it done. They died multiple times along the way, but they finally managed to clear this place on heroic difficulty. And it took nearly three hours. That doesn't really seem to be the case anymore. <laughs> Actually, to be fair, it hasn't really been the case for some time now. I, I never really... I used to be a hardcore raider in World of Warcraft, but it was turning into a pretty much full-time job. And in the Cataclysm expansion, I left the raid team. And I've basically been a dirty, filthy casual since then. In fact, I don't really run dungeons at all. I mean, if I've been given a quest that means I have to go into a dungeon to complete it, then I'll go into the dungeon. But otherwise, I, I pretty much don't bother. I, I mainly just run daily quests and chase achievements on all of my various characters. And as I understand it in the previous expansion, Legion, uh, heroic level dungeons were not much of a challenge either. Even so, at the same time, what I was watching on Saturday night on Quickie Baby's livestream was a pretty much brand new maximum level character running through normal difficulty dungeons. And then the very second he'd gotten the required level of equipment to qualify him to start running heroic level dungeons, he started clearing those at a dizzying rate. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the second the Dungeon Finder tool decided that he had enough equipment to be able to run Mythic difficulty dungeons, he started running those as well. And he was clearing them. Um, it wasn't easy, but he's a pretty good tank, and his wife Peppy seems to be a pretty good healer as well. So, you know, it was hard work. But the fact remained that within the space of one evening he'd gone from normal straight through heroic to mythic level dungeon clearing in one evening now i'm all for making your content accessible to the masses this was a problem that world of warcraft suffered from back in the early days prior to any expansions being released for the game the top level of raiding there was a raid called nax ramus and if you hadn't been farming the previous level of raid content for months in order to gear up, you wouldn't even survive past the front door. Which made no sense whatsoever, from an economic point of view. I mean, if Blizzard are spending millions of dollars developing all of this content for endgame raiding, but they've made it so hard that only 2 or 3% at the most of the people playing your game are ever going to see any of it, let alone clear it, then that's... Well, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. On the other hand, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you've got to learn to pace yourself, Blizzard. I mean, you've got the one extreme where you're putting in content that is so incredibly hard that hardly anybody's ever going to get to experience any of it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you're making stuff so ridiculously easy that in the space of one evening, People are going from normal, straight through heroic, and straight into mythic level dungeons. Now, I appreciate that I did earlier say that there is a dizzying amount of content available in a game like World of Warcraft. And there is. At the same time, however, maybe it's not such a good idea to have all of your dungeon content completable at mythic difficulty in the space of one day. Maybe you might want to pace that out a little, just a bit. I do apologise to everybody who doesn't actually play World of Warcraft, but you have to understand I'm not specifically talking about World of Warcraft here. I'm talking about content in games and the pace of the delivery of content in games. Some games get it right, some games... Yeah, maybe not so much. Anyway. Goodness me, is that the time? Well, that's just about it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I am, of course, going to Gamescom this week. Uh, as I said in last week's Mingles with Jingles, I wasn't actually planning to, but when Wargaming offered to fly me out there on their dollar, I thought, well, what the hell, why not? Uh, so we're arriving on Thursday. 
um, which I believe is, yes, in fact, that is the night of the player party. So anybody who is going to be at the Wargaming Player Party this Thursday in Cologne in Germany for Gamescom will see you there. We might be a little late, because as I understand it, the player party begins at half seven, but our flight isn't actually arriving until two hours before that, and then we have to get to the hotel and clear customs and all that sort of thing. So we may be a little late, but if you are going to the Wargaming Player Party at Gamescom this year, uh, Rita and I will both see you there. Friday, I pretty much have the data myself, although Mr. Conway's been trying to tempt me onto the main stage to throw goodie bags and t-shirts at the audience. So we'll probably be doing some of that. And then Saturday, I'll be live streaming World of Warships from Gamescom on behalf of Wargaming. Sunday, we're coming home. And that means there's going to be no episode of Mingles with Jingles next week, because the last thing that I want to do after travelling all day is get home grab a cup of coffee, sit down, and immediately start work on a video. But normal service will be resumed on Tuesday of next week. And that's pretty much it for today. If you're going to Gamescom, hope to see you there. If I don't see you there, I hope you enjoy Gamescom anyway. Try to avoid the beer. It's piss. <laughs> I make no apologies. The rest of Germany will agree with me. Um, and as always, take care. And I'll catch you next time.